uh, welcome to this side event on the uses of information communication technology to protect human rights co-organized between the Office of the Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Summary or Arbitrary Executions and the International Service for Human Rights. I'd, without further ado, like to turn to the Special Rapporteur to, to kick us off and to describe the, the, the background and, and the major contents of the report that he will be presenting later on today. So the report starts by saying that the traditional approach was really that uh, intergovernmental organizations had some lawyers who worked with the available evidence and then tried to analyze that and to do human rights monitoring in terms of that. And that's still important, that's still being done. But that was then in the second place supplemented by um, fact-finding by NGOs who go out and see witnesses, identify them, get information and, and act on the basis of that information. Um, the third wave or the third generation is in really where uh, the, the one of citizen witnesses who bring facts. So it's no longer a question of having to go out and find facts, but facts are made available. Um, and really this increase of agency, of pluralism, of, of uh, more parties being able to participate in what human rights are. And it always strikes me as when we talk about the universality of human rights, that it's not just the one set of rules that is made applicable to everyone, but there's a, a, second comp a second dimension to human rights, and that is that everybody has an input into what those rules are. Um, and that the digital uh, capacity also increases our ability for everybody to be involved in the human rights project. So it is a shift from a welcome shift from a top-down sort of approach to a bottom-up approach and I'm not saying it should either be the one or the other but the, the increased uh, ability of people from the ground also to influence uh, the human rights uh, debate. My own interest in this, uh, in this issue uh, was largely prompted by my experience just as when I was appointed five years ago as Special Rapporteur on Sri Lanka when a video clip, a cell phone clip, was made available five minutes of executions in Sri Lanka um, and I was confronted with the, with the, um, the reality of having to uh, say whether this video has been doctored as it has been labelled. Um, and many of us, I think, are ill-prepared for that sort of challenge. And it struck me then uh, what the potential is of such uh, evidence. Um, and in that particular case, I was fortunate to get experts to assist and with authenticating the video uh, used by Channel 4 and by others, um, and then influencing the whole process of accountability together with many other uh, influences that, that, that played a role. Um, but it struck me that this is a very powerful tool which, if used in the right way, can have very uh, important effects. If it's used in the wrong way, it can really also be very counterproductive. Also, in a, in a subsequent report uh, on the safety of journalists, it struck me what role digital information plays, the safety of the journalists uh, who are dealing with this, um, and how much of the information is it comes to them from, from citizen witnesses and others. Um, it also strikes me when we go on country visits, um, so we do typically twice a year go for say two weeks to a particular country, um, it strikes me that we meet with civil society, we, we meet with government officials, but in many ways we, and, and, and with the we I mean here the special procedures, we are not really always uh, inter engaging with digital evidence as much as we potentially could. Uh, that w which is available in our preparation to make sure that we take some of that with us and I, I, I think it's, it's important for us to consider whether it may be a good thing and, in, in, and this is something that needs to be thought through properly to have some particularly uh, uh, salient uh, uh, incidents available for example if you meet with uh, government officials um, to show them the evidence on which you are basing your, your comments. We often have documents that we show them, uh, but I think we need to think more broadly of how we can, in our preparation for visits, but also during the visits, uh, that it becomes more known to people that they can provide us with digital information and that we, in a way, are able of, of dealing with it because one doesn't want to create false expectations as well. Um, but I think these are things that, that we, from, from the side of the special procedures and others, um, need, to, need to look at and need to consider. So uh, I'm happy that the mandate can provide, to some extent, a platform for this discussion, which I think is going on worldwide uh, and hopefully uh, makes a contribution towards the um, interaction between these various generations of, of fact-finders um, and, and to make sure that we are all 
uh, in one way or another engaging with these with the, the possibilities and also the challenges offered uh, by this shift to digital information. The UN, of course, is already using um, digital information in many ways. Um, so with the Department um, of, of Peacekeeping Affairs, um, Humanitarian Affairs, and then outside uh, also in other bodies. And so the report sets out some ways in which digital information can play a role in terms of uh, promotion and advocacy, prevention and protection, and then also um, in terms of fact-finding and accountability. On promotion and advocacy, it mentions the role that websites, blogs play um, in terms of promoting particular causes, messages that can be sent, messages uh, of, of advocacy. Um, also, in my own mandate, we use we put legislation on a website so that, it, for example, on the use of force by law enforcement officials, because it's in, it's incredibly difficult to find updated legislation in many cases, and when the process such as the universal peer review takes place, or um, uh, uh, treaty bodies consider the situation in a particular country, and even NGOs, often a lot of time is spent on just finding the relevant legislation. So we have, for example, a website www.use-of-force.info where we put the legislation of all countries concerning the use of force so people can be measured against that and that legislation can be measured against the international standards. Also, of course, messages can be sent out to support a particular cause by protesters, but there's also the reverse. I just come from another side event where people were talking about protesters while they are in the street receiving SMS uh, saying, we know that you are out there, and they do not know where it comes from, which of course is a very uh, uh, intimidating message uh, to receive. Um, so uh, in terms of promotion advocacy, it can be used in, in, in different ways, um, and I think the, the challenge for all of us is to navigate the right way in terms of the affordances and the dangers that may be, may be posed, and to be aware of how it can be used by all different sides. Um, so in the second place, prevention and protection. Um, we know about the alert applications that are being developed um, by various uh, organizations uh, and some organizations represented here as well. And I think we will hear more about that. Welcome. Um, the panic buttons, um, because we know that the first 48 hours when somebody disappears is, is, uh, is the most important. Um, of course, at the same time with that, the issues are that this may lead to identification of individuals uh, if your cell phone is, is uh, confiscated and this application is found on your cell phone, this may be used against you and for that reason uh, there has been the call for all cell phones to be issued with the same technology so it doesn't single out particular individuals. Um, and of course the issues of digital security I think that needs to be mediated in terms of alert applications as well. Um, monitoring for protection uh, I think plays very much the same role in terms of prevention and protection. Uh, we know that body cameras increasingly play a role um, and many including myself have called for the increased use of body cameras um, and some of the earlier studies indicate that uh, between 60 and 90 percent of the uses of force or claims about excessive use of force are reduced uh, by the use of, of body cameras. Um, and also satellites, uh, drones um, from a distance can play the same role, CCTV cameras. In particular, if people know that this is operating, uh, it may uh, serve as a have a chilling effect on those who have the potential to use force. I think at the same time it's also important in this context while we need to look at the potential offered by, by such um, monitoring equipment, to see the potential dangers as well and uh, certainly the idea of a surveillance state, a state that sees itself at, as at liberty to film everything and to uh, follow everything, um, that, that there is a, uh, a danger that having surveillance in order to protect life, for example, and protect other human rights, that that may also uh, play into the hands of, of violations of right to privacy um, as well as, as a state that feels itself empowered to, to take very far-reaching steps as far as, um, as the, um, the private lives of individuals are concerned. 
In the last place, then uh, fact finding and the role that digital um, uh, capabilities can play in terms of, of fact finding. Um, and as I've mentioned at the beginning, I think what is very attractive about it is the spontaneous nature of this that everybody has, uh, in many cases, has a, a cell phone available, perhaps a smartphone, um, and in a non-mediated way uh, can capture information that, that can be used. Um, so cell phones certainly play a, a, a strong role. Um, in some cases, uh, the technology may limit the metadata, um, but uh, new technology becomes available which keeps the metadata that can be used uh, later on. Uh, I think crowdsourcing plays a, a strong role also in terms of corroboration of, of the digital inf information, um, so that individuals certainly still play a role. Um, and it's human uh, engagement, not just uh, mechanical uh, and, and, and technological engagement um, that is eventually uh, the arbiter. Um, satellites, I think, uh, can play an important role also in change detection, so that if individual witnesses say that a whole village, village was wiped out and they describe how that had happened, if that can be confirmed through a satellite, um, I think that, that that also plays into a more responsible reaction and in, in, in many cases also hopefully a more forceful uh, response when that happens. Evaluation of evidence is dealt with in the report, um, uh, the issue of volume, how do you deal with the uh, bandwidth problem that you have a lot of information coming in at the same time. Um, which certainly is in, in, a, in a world of limited capacity and if I think about my own position as a mandate holder as well, the limited capacity that I together with my staff members have. Um, so how do you deal with the volumes that come in? Um, the short time uh, that uh, uh, videos are often available, uh, for example on YouTube because of uh, the complaints that people legitimately have about the content, for example if it involves uh, a killings, um, but the problem that arises, how do you store that information later on? Because now you know about this particular issue, but how do you prove it if that information is no longer available? And then, of course, verification. Um, the, the importance for the legitimacy of the office, I certainly knew when, when I dealt with the Sri Lanka material that it's a career stopper and probably uh, uh, it will do long, very long-term damage to special procedure and to my mandate if I ended up authenticating a video and saying it wasn't doctored and it proves eventually to have been a doctored video. Um, so the legitimacy of the organization, this applies to, to, to everybody involved, NGOs and, and, and everyone else, um, in terms of the responsibility uh, of, uh, on, on our shoulders to ensure that what we say is justifiable. But also digital wildfires, information that is spread and maybe false information that is spread uh, that result in, in harm um, being done. In conclusion, um, I don't think that digital information and, and information gathering should replace traditional ways of gathering information. In the end, it's still a human responsibility. Um, and the overall uh, capacity of the, u the individuals involved, I think, will determine the integrity of, of the outcomes. Uh, rubbish in, rubbish out, as it's, as it's often said. Um, but the, the, the human decision-making component, I think, as with, with all things, remain the important aspect. This is a tool to be used, and it's a tool that can be used in a good or a, or a bad way. Uh, I also see as particularly important the digital divide. Um, coming from South Africa, from Africa myself, um, I'm struck by the um, extent to which if the mindset develops that if it's not digital, it doesn't exist, um, that we, if we're only going to look at situations where body cameras were used and follow up on those, we're going to divert a lot of our attention to those particular cases and perhaps away from many other cases, uh, numbering hundreds of thousands, um, which are not uh, recorded and which are not available. And we need to find a way of making sure that by giving a stronger role to ICTs that we do not in a way downgrade the attention that we give to societies that may have cell phones and may have the capacities uh, but have not, are not as connected as may be the case in many other societies. Um, when we're talking about 
technology and the use of social media as a human rights tool. Uh, it's, there's been quite a development over the past four years, especially since the start of the protest movement in many different countries in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, and just like we've seen civil society and human rights defenders develop uh, in their use of social media as a tool for human rights, we've also seen governments learn how to use social media and, and, um, and the internet for their own benefit as well. Um, in our activism, when I used, I used to be the acting president of the Bahrain Center for Human Rights, and one of the things we did is we used Twitter, uh, which was our main medium, as a tool for documentation. Um, so when we were going around, when we were participating or monitoring protests, uh, when we saw people getting killed, I remember I myself in 2011 was at the hospital in Bahrain uh, documenting people who had been killed and or injured. Um, and Twitter was becoming our main tool of documentation. We take a picture, we write what's going on, and then those pictures we will use later on also for our report writing. So it was essentially the first tool that we would actually use for documentation became tw Twitter. And that was, not, that was for two reasons. It wasn't just for documentation purposes, it was also to make sure that people outside of Bahrain knew what was going on. As a human rights defender, I was someone who had to leave the country, and now I am living in exile. Um, I was actually sentenced uh, to one year imprisonment last year by the Bahraini government. And so I can no longer go back to the country and we depend now on the internet as a means of documentation. We have people on the ground who are undercover who document the human rights situation and then they will send the information to us. Now of course this also proposes challenges because it means you have to be able to set up a secure communication system where you don't uh, put the people who are communicating with you and sending you the information in danger um, and, then risk the, and then put them at the risk of arrest and or torture. Um, and this for us, of course, has been a huge concern. One of the things that we've done as a method of trying to overcome the security issues is um, the BCHR, when I was running it along with partner organizations, actually ran an OECD complaint against uh, companies in the EU that were selling spyware technology to the Bahraini government, which was then being used to target human rights defenders and activists on the ground. Um, and an OECD complaint that was actually successful. Um, so I think that we're, we're trying to find new mediums and new mechanisms and methodologies that we can use both for accountability, for the companies that enable the governments to be able to spy on different people. I mean, in Bahrain, it's, Bahrain is one of the countries that's actually used as an example when talking about uh, people who are being put in prison because of Twitter and because of writing on Twitter. Uh, it's being used as an example for a government that uses surveillance um, and uh, for defamation purposes, but it's also used as an example for a government that's very good at using spyware. And so it becomes a real challenge because as we learn and as we move ahead with using technology, so does the government. One thing that I actually think is very important and we've seen develop, there's actually a new app that's been developed that documents things, videos and pictures, in a way that can then be used in a courtroom. So previously we had this problem with, you know, when we see a picture, when we see a video, we no longer can really 100% tell for sure if it's real or not. Just like the video that we saw in Syria of the little boy saving his sister. And so it, that, that has become a real challenge. And so now IT groups have actually developed an app that will document the event in a way uh, that can actually be then presented in a courtroom, um, hopefully someday in the future when we actually have a real judiciary system in Bahrain, that we can actually present evidence that was documented um, during, the, during the crackdown by the government. Thank you. Now, the idea of people turning to clicktivism uh, instead of actually going out on the streets, I think that it's not necessarily just the idea that people sit at home and go on the internet and feel like they're actively participating in an uprising or a protest movement and whatnot. I think it's also the issue of um, whenever we see space for protest movements, especially peaceful protests, becoming closed and for when the government starts to crack down and there's no longer real space for people to go out on the streets we see more and more people turning to the internet and turning to mediums like so, like twitter and facebook as a way of expressing themselves um, and i think that that's something that we've seen a lot in bahrain in bahrain over the past four years 
uh, space for peaceful dissent has become almost completely closed off by the government. The control of public space has in immensely increased. And so what has happened is that because people get attacked as soon as they leave their homes to join a protest, um, even though protests are still ongoing in Bahrain until today, um, but a lot of people are now turning more into mediums like Twitter and like Facebook to express themselves and to protest. Now, of course, again, the, with protest movements, you're at risk of being shot. You might be able to run away. With the internet, you're always being surveyed. There are so many different methodologies for the government. It's much, uh, I mean, I would say in a sense, it's, it's even less safe to be on the internet than sometimes it is to be on the streets. Because on the streets, you might be able to go into a house and hide. Uh, if they're using tear gas and not lethal ammunition, you know, you might be subjected to physical harm, but there's a limit to it. Whereas if you're using the internet and where you're using um, Twitter and so on, it's usually things that you cannot get rid of. You cannot delete permanently your Facebook account. The information is always going to be there. And if the government in a way was able to access your information, you're always going to be at risk of being exposed and then at risk of being arrested. I wouldn't say that being online is necessarily preaching to the choir. Uh, and I would say this from experience. Uh, I'm very, very active on Twitter. I have about 102,000 followers. And I've seen how, first of all, you can face people who um, disagree with you respectfully and you can have really nice discussions. But then there are people who, because they can be anonymous, it means that they are much more likely to use, um, you know, whether it's threats or to use defamation or to call you names. And especially when it comes to women, that's something that's a lot more popular. Uh, especially the use of terms like slut or whore or prostitute and so on uh, in a way of interacting with women online. Um, so we've seen that online you can be just as much of a target uh, as you can when you're working on the streets and especially when it comes to defamation campaigns carried out by governments who have a lot of money. Um, five years ago, the internet started to be this tool that could be used by our partners that were sending us information that we previously maybe weren't getting um, from locations or regions where we didn't have access. Um, information was coming faster and that was also pushing us to have to move the enormous amnesty machine uh, to respond faster as well and to be more relevant. Um, and at the same time, new information was coming that had evidentiary value. So. Uh, t different forms of information, information that we've just not previously been handling. Um, and I think it came with this, this tightrope that we have to walk between trying to make use of what that can bring in, in our work as human rights watchdogs, as investigators, um, as advocates, but also this in incredible awareness that I think, is, as Mariam points out, is actually something that's been unfolding just year by year and is even more pressing now than it has ever been, which is that the security challenges related two new technologies um, and we've had the experience of trying to respond to some of these by developing technologies which is quite an unusual and interesting experience as a huge global international NGO to, to the first time to be thinking how do we actually respond not through advocacy not through petitions not through uh, documenting the violations and trying to change the laws but through potentially developing tools that can assist those that we work with um, I'll just mention two of them very briefly uh, the panic button application that we've been working on um, was in response to the fact that as we see people who've been in protest situations in streets but also human rights defenders going about their business, uh, going into in high risk environments often to talk to sources, to talk to victims, um, more and more, nearly all of them are carrying some form of a mobile phone. Um, and as they face risks, particularly we would focus on uh, enforced disappearances, but also other kinds of attacks from the state and from other actors, uh, how could that mobile phone be a lifeline to their network? Um, and so we focused on building an app that would send an emergency alert as quickly as possible to an, a human rights defender's trusted network. Um, and it would also send their location information and update that network as, as to the location of the phone. Um, but a couple of things that we designed specifically for human rights defenders is, is the fact that it is possible to trigger from just a hardware button on the phone, meaning they don't have to go into the app, and also that it's disguised, so it looks like a simple calculator or other generic um, uh, Im image, uh, generic app on the phone, and that's just to delay discovery by a perpetrator so that it can continue sending out location. Um, one of the things that's really difficult about that is saying, is explaining to human rights defenders 
in the course of the trainings and, and uh, materials that we offer that on the one hand we're saying this is this is a helpful way for you to reach your network fast in an emergency and at the same time sending them the message your phone is an inherently insecure device it's leaking information about your whereabouts constantly um, your contacts your communications and the, the communications or sensitive information you hold on others um, so I think and that's been a really difficult trade-off for us to make you know when can it be useful when should a defender carry their phone because it's going to help them in a situation of risk versus when it's actually better to leave their phone at home and not carry any technology whatsoever um, and that's ultimately there's not an answer to that question and I think it's it's exciting to see the progression and maturity of this field that we no longer talk only about the tools and we talk more about the strategies um, it, the answer to that question is actually about uh, trade-offs and assessments of security which human rights defenders have to make all of the time and I think all of us as organizations supporting human rights defenders have to also understand how to how to empower people to make those decisions. Um, I just realized I was going to mention really briefly a second tool which I'll just say for a second partly because Mariam mentioned the prevalence of spyware. We also had to work on a, on a project with a bunch of um, technologists um, and other organizations, EFF, Privacy International, um, security researchers on a tool that helps human rights defenders search for spyware on their computers um, and again that's totally new for us to be thinking how do we document these kinds of new forms of state control where governments can send a very intrusive piece of malware onto your computer see everything that you're doing I've had human rights defenders say to me that feel like there's somebody in their head it's it's a very new type of, um, of control and it's incredibly terrifying and I think Unlike just physical surveillance, I think the chilling effect that it's having is, is, is profound. Um, I work for an international human rights organization called Witness, and what we do is we train activists all over the world to use video to enhance the protection of human rights and to change human rights practices, policy, and law. And there are three reasons that I think that training of activists are absolutely a non-negotiable. The first is because of principle. If we look at, as an, as an international community, we have decided to honor the right to the benefits of science and the right to scientific information. So just as we wouldn't deny a person the right to life-saving medicine, we shouldn't be denying people true access to technology that can save their lives. We also should not be denying them access to information on how to use those technologies, and we shouldn't be denying them access to information that is derived from those technologies. The second reason that I believe that training is absolutely essential is a practical reason, and that stems from what the ICC has said out loud. The ICC has said that without co collaborating with frontline defenders on the ground, they may never discover or obtain the evidence that's needed to put perpetrators behind bars. Okay? There's an obvious reason for this. The frontline defenders are the people that are there. They're the ones that are documenting. They're the ones that are knowing what's going on minute by minute. The International Criminal Court and, un and other international investigators may not come in until weeks, months, possibly even years later when that evidence has been deteriorated or gone. The International Criminal Court has also said that training and guidelines are essential for human rights defenders to gather information that has probative value in court. And I have the honor of traveling all over the world, and I not only hear this from the International Criminal Court, but I hear this from attorneys in Brazil, in the Ukraine, in India, everywhere. So I think that that is really the second reason that we absolutely need training, is so that we can collect this evidence that has, that is admissible to court. The third reason is because we need to even the playing field, and this has been brought up a couple of times. Perpetrators are using technology. A really simple example from Brazil, in Brazil, plainclothes police officers are trained to infiltrate protests. They're given video cameras, and they're given a shot list. They're given images to collect. For example, 
These police officers are taught to film the protester's shoes because a protester will change clothes frequently, but they will not change their shoes, so they can use this for an identification technique. So just as the perpetrators are armed with knowledge on technically how to use these ICTs, they also know, have to know what to collect so that we have relevant information. So there's many other reasons why I feel that training is essential for frontline defenders, but those are my top three. Activism is basically happening online. We, we all know that. that. We're using WhatsApp, we're using Facebook, we're using YouTube. So in part, I believe it's the technology companies that have a responsibility to make these safe spaces for us to, to organize and to share and to upload. And, and, and basically protect all of our human rights. What Witness is working on is three different ways in the discussions with these tech companies as well as the states in which we can protect human rights values online. And the first one goes to the takedown policies. A lot of the information that's being collected tests the limits of the community guidelines. And so these companies have to make it clear exactly what is and what is not allowed on, on their online platforms. They have to make it clear how to flag that material so that if activists do upload that material, they can note that this is valuable human rights footage. And then third, if the footage is taken down, there has to be a clear appeals process to ensure that that video can stay present online. The next thing that I want to talk about is proof mode. Um, earlier, a cam an app was brought up that will, it's a camera and it basically has all the metadata in it so that that video could be more easily used in court. It's called Informacam. And as we all know, metadata is by default embedded into every video and into every photo. But what we want to make sure is that activists have an option for what we're calling proof mode. Because if you upload your video with all that metadata, that's great from an ICC perspective or from a court perspective, because all that metadata will help you verify the video much easier. But it is very challenging from a safety and security perspective. So we want to give activists the option to sign into that proof mode so that sometimes you can have the metadata and sometimes you can't, which takes us to privacy and security. We want to make sure that all of the platforms that are out there, the Facebooks, the Twitters, etc., are including privacy and security by design. An example of that is YouTube has included the opportunity to use facial blurring, facial recognition that blurs faces. So if I upload video online of deplorable conditions in a neuro, neuropsychiatric hospital, I can blur out those faces to protect the patient's privacy. If I'm a protester and I am at a protest and I'm filming excessive police violence, then I can film the faces of the other protesters there so that I can protect their identity so that they're not later gone after. So those are three of the key things of the absolutely many policy choices that we have to embed into all of our platforms and into all of our laws and into all of our policies. Um, I, I joined Human Rights Watch in 2012. Um, before that time, we, have, we had 100 researchers who were doing phenomenal research on the ground with very low technology, primarily a pen, a paper, a camera. Um, the low-tech way is the primary way that we continue and always will continue to do our research. And I was brought on board to provide an internal capacity to add into that, obviously, to take advantage of the new digital information resources, methodologies, and opportunities that this revolution that we've seen over the last two decades is, is having on, on the ability of, of independent organizations to conduct authoritative and and compelling investigations on IHL and human rights violations. Um, my work involves satellite imagery and video. Um, I, I won't, I'll resist to use the word forensics because it's um, a loaded term, maybe video authentication and light analysis. Uh, this always starts with the question of where is this video? 
uh, filmed, uh, when was it filmed, what time of day, what season, can we determine with more authenticity the exact date period. This is where the satellite imagery comes in, the three-dimensional modeling. In many cases, but not all, um, the videos have very prominent features and landmarks, and those can be matched with satellite images. They can, we can reconstruct a three-dimensional model from that video and, and ideally additional videos to understand and measure then the shadow length and the orientation, and that gives us a very, very accurate understanding about the time of day the video was recorded and the season. And if there are changes in the background, there's construction, there, there's demolition, there's, there's fighting, then the, 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 the satellite imagery provides us with an ability to get a very, very precise idea about the date period of which the video was, was established. And surprisingly enough, um, the, the, in many ways, the most powerful and easiest way to do video authentication is when it's secure to just contact the person who recorded it. Um, in mo most cases, even in Syria, you can get a secure line, you can arrange something, and they're on Facebook, they're on Twitter, they're on Instagram. You just simply contact them and you ask them, where did you film it? Um, do you have additional information? Do you have the original files that we can review the metadata with? And then, most importantly, um, could you please go outside and take a picture of that exact location right now? Um, we've had this multiple times when people were, they claimed they were living next to this major airstrike location. Fine, go out and take a picture of it right now. And they do. And within half an hour, we have a complete verification of, of this material. Um, it works surprisingly well in, in many circumstances, although obviously you can't depend upon it. And so that really emphasizes the need for a much more dynamic and fluid and flexible approach where you have lots of different tools and lots of different techniques and you really sort of m mixing and matching these, uh, these, these tools to fit the needs of the investigation and the limitations of the data that is, that is on hand. Um, obviously the, the real skill sets that we, that we need to improve and where all of us really I think are, are looking for are the much more advanced forensic computer vision and machine learning capabilities to really look at detailed um, cap look at um, detailed instances where the video has been deliberately manufactured and manipulated. Um, I've been to many conferences where I've seen computer vision academic departments magically insert people and objects and if you look at CGI technology and, and movies today it really will become quite a challenge for us to to untangle this with the current skill sets that we have. Um, but the golden rule is we don't use it if we don't, if we're not 100% certain. And even, in th even when we are certain, there's been many cases when we have, act we, have, we have not released any information regarding a particular video because we knew the act of reporting the location of the video would in fact endanger that, that person. Um, this happens quite frequently in Syria. It, it really speaks to the, the larger need to have to, to have an evidentiary package of material that, that integrates social media dependent information but is not exclusively dependent upon it because obviously if that's all you have and you, you can't use it, well, uh, there's, there's not much value and that's where the, the additional the testimony, the traditional investigative techniques, uh, I don't mean to go on, but I was going to show uh, just a quick uh, example here. Um, I won't show you the entire video, but this is a typical example of a video um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it was reportedly recorded in North Sinai. Well, why don't we just stop it right there? It's, um, yeah, it, 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 it gets worse. The video was posted online. What it shows, or what it purports to show is uh, a young man, uh, several men actually, who are being detained by Egyptian armed forces. Uh, they're wounded, they're injured, they're being dragged, kicked, and beaten, and they're taken to this building, and they're put inside this green door, okay? The video has no metadata. It's been uploaded to YouTube, and there's lots and lots of commentary. People are claiming it's all sorts of things. It's all sorts of locations. Um, what we did first was to identify the location. Now, we, we tracked down people who, who uploaded the video, they told us where they thought it had been recorded. And we used that information then to 
to identify the exact building and the exact location using satellite imagery as well as photographs that were uh, that had been posted to another social media site these were tourist photos that had been recorded of that exact intersection years earlier we go to the next slide um, so this is a very quick example of uh, very, very uh, quick and easy uh, 3D uh, shadow modeling to give us an idea of the time of day that the video is recorded and to assess the seasonality. Um, obviously, the shadow length and the orientation in terms of the, 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 in terms of the, the streets and the landmarks is something that's fixed to the season. It will change over time. And so that gives us a very, very um, a, a good uh, degree of confidence that it had been recorded indeed in the fall, sometime between 8 and 9 a.m. Next slide. For one or two frames, what we can see after we process it a little bit is that these two men who are thrown into this room are in fact being put into a prison. It is a holding cell. There are multiple men who are already residing in this location. Next slide. This is the tourist photo that was recorded in 2009. It's freely available in, in one of the many uh, different uh, uh, photo upload sites. What we can see are two uh, APC, Egyptian APC armed carriers that are positioned at this exact location. And this is in 2009. And obviously, the implication of this photograph is that this is not a new location. This is, in fact, a, a, an unreported detention facility of the Egyptian authorities that has existed since 2009. And so that's one of the ways in which we, we, would, uh, we would work with the, those photos, this, with the current skill sets that we have. Um, but the golden rule is we don't use it if, we don't, if we're not 100% certain. And even, in the, even when we are certain, there have been many cases when we have, act, we, have, we have not released any information regarding a particular video because we knew the act of reporting the location of the video would in fact endanger that, that person. Um, this happens quite frequently in Syria. It, it really speaks to the, the larger need to have, to, to have an evidentiary package of material that, that integrates social media dependent information but is not exclusively dependent upon it because obviously if that's all you have and you, you can't use it, well, uh, there's, there's not much value, and that's where the, the additional the testimony, the traditional investigative techniques. Uh, I don't mean to go on, but I was going to show uh, just a quick uh, example here. Um, I won't show you the entire video, but this is a typical example of a video. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it was reportedly recorded in North Sinai. Well, why don't we just stop it right there? It's, um, yeah. It, 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 it gets worse. This video was posted to us. Um, if we could continue with those slides. Sorry. Please. And if you would put it into a screen mode. Um, the video was posted online. What it shows, or what it purports to show, is uh, a young man, uh, several men actually, who are being detained by Egyptian armed forces. Uh, they are wounded, they are injured, they are being dragged, kicked, and beaten, and they are taken to this building, and they are put inside this green door. Okay? The video has no metadata, it's been uploaded to YouTube, and there's lots and lots of commentary. People are claiming it's all sorts of things, it's all sorts of locations. Um, what we did first was to identify the location. Now we, we tracked down people who, who uploaded the video, they told us where they thought it had been recorded. And we used that information then to, to identify the exact building and the exact location using satellite imagery, as well as photographs that, were, uh, that had been posted to another social media site. These were tourist photos that had been recorded of that exact intersection years earlier. We go to the next slide. Um, so this is a very quick example of uh, very, very uh, quick and easy uh, 3D uh, shadow modeling to give us an idea of the time of day that the video is recorded and to assess the seasonality. Um, obviously, the shadow length and the orientation in terms of the, 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 in terms of the, the streets and the landmarks is something that's fixed to the season. It will change over time. And so that gives us a very, very um, a, a good uh, degree of confidence that it had been recorded indeed in the fall, sometime between 8 and 9 a.m. Next slide. 
for one or two frames, what we can see after we process it a little bit is that these two men who are thrown into this room are in fact being put into a prison. It is a holding cell. There are multiple men who are already residing in this location. Next slide. This is the tourist photo that was recorded in 2009. It's freely available in, in one of the many uh, different uh, uh, photo upload sites. What we can see are two uh, APC, Egyptian APC armed carriers that are positioned at this exact location. And this is in 2009. And obviously, the implication of this photograph is that this is not a new location. This is, in fact, a, a, an unreported detention facility of the Egyptian authorities that has existed since 2009. And so that's one of the ways in which we, we, would, uh, we would work with the, those photos. Go ahead. Um, so what are, what are the sort of main platforms that we deal with on, on a daily basis? Um, they, they span everything from sort of Twitter to blogs to YouTube to, uh, uh, to, um, to uh, uh, normal internet pages, traditional news sources. Um, but I think the big one really is, is, is Facebook. Um, and it's a very information-rich um, platform. And uh, I'm going to show in a while how that's a good and a bad thing um, for us. Uh, but I also want to talk about uh, I, I also want to talk about some other um, some other sources that fall under the, the broad category of, of digital, um, which we use. And these are traditional digital media carriers. So phones, um, phones that have never seen the internet, ordinary Bluetooth phones like the Nokia, which we all used to carry, um, you know, ten years ago, and uh, which some of us still do. Um, uh, People's, uh, people's, uh, people's ICT equipment, which has been seized in, 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 the, in the course of criminal investigations. Um, call data records. Um, the fact is that no, none of these sources exist in a, in a vacuum, and um, there's a range of expertise required. The expertise that's required to, to make use of social media, in a way, is much more an, invest, an ordinary investigator's uh, expertise. That's where I come in. Um, the expertise that's required to do analysis of call data records um, is uh, it's an analyst's expertise set and uh, it's, it's quite different to, to anything I do. And the expertise that's required to, um, in a forensic manner, extract information from a digital media carrier, that's a very traditional cyber investigator's job. Um, and, uh, you know, we have some very fine colleagues from, uh, uh, who are specialized in that department and it's, uh, it's again a very different, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's again a very different type of work. Um, the challenge for us is to get all of those working together. Um, and, uh, if we were to look at a case um, like a situation like the Demo Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, now, videos were used in the uh, in the Lubanga case, um, in uh, in part of a, a successful uh, 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 in, in part of a in part of a an effort to uh, to prove that child soldiers were were knowingly recruited and used. Now, those videos didn't appear on YouTube. Um, they they were much more akin to uh, what we were used to before. So they were um, the product of, of people lumping big camera equipment into the field and making very professional videos. And we saw the same thing in, in Srebrenica, uh, where video was very key. And this is reaching back into, into the experience of uh, the ICTY. Um, and again, what we were looking, what, what became key in Srebrenica was essentially a piece of perpetrator video which was a very partisan uh, journalist who had, uh, who had documented the uh, activities um, uh, in and around, uh, in and around um, uh, those events. Um, and while they were being used for propaganda purposes uh, in that person's mind, uh, they subsequently played a very important uh, part um, in making those uh, accusations stand up in court. But that didn't happen in a vacuum. I mean, nothing ever comes to uh, nothing ever comes to 
to court just as a, as a video itself. I, I, I can't rule that out in, in the future. It could be possible. Um, but uh, I think, you know, for, from what we see, there is always a person um, attached to those videos. And uh, international criminal justice, at the end of the day, still depends on very disadvantaged people without any of the benefits of those who have access to the leaders, to the levers of power, standing up in a court, exposing themselves, saying what happened to them, and taking all those brave moves. So that could be the videographer attached to a video. Um, it, could be, it could be a person giving a witness statement. It could be an insider who's maybe thought better uh, of some of the things that, uh, that they were caught up in or, or uh, actively pursued at the time. Um, Whatever it is, when by the time it, it gets to court, uh, all of this content is, uh, is embedded in a much more complex uh, legal context. Um, if, you think of, if you think of what happens on, on YouTube, Facebook, and the, the workflows uh, described by Josh, and um, the, the digital activism that so many, like uh, Miriam, are, are engaged in. Um, that's quite different to a court environment. Court is very inward looking. Um, courts, by their nature, tend to be much better at examining a whole lot of data that exists inside their institutions than looking outside and, uh, and, and processing uh, new data. So all our technology um, all the stuff that's been invested in traditionally tends to, be, tends to be material which is very good at sifting through existing documents in the court's, in the, in, in the court's possession, which have been transcribed and uh, processed in many different ways and, and reviewed. Um, the, the challenge really is uh, introducing new forms of, uh, new forms of uh, evidence um, and information into that scenario. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it throws up a whole lot of internal questions. Um, for instance, we have uh, very strict obligations at uh, the International Criminal Court um, to conduct fair investigations. That means that we act for the uh, defense um, as well as the prosecutor. And uh, partly arising from that obligation, um, we, incur, uh, we incur a great uh, responsibility in terms of disclosure and review. So that raises protection issues, and I'll tell you why. In the normal course of events, um, certain material is sensitive. A person is not yet ready to stand up in court, and uh, we still have to disclose material to the defence. And it goes through a very careful redaction. Um, process and a very careful review process to make sure that if there's exonerating or potentially exonerating information in there, it's not ignored. So everything we collect has to be looked at. It has to be processed with, uh, with our obligations towards fairness and the security of the people we're in contact with in mind. Which means that if we start collecting huge amounts of data, um, we'd face a very serious problem in terms of our ability to process that in a correct and safe manner. The other um, big challenge that we face in regard to this, uh, this new material um, arises from uh, a jurisdictional issue. Um, if we were operating in a national context, uh, we would be able to approach companies to make sure that uh, what we had uh, could be backed up. We would ask them for, uh, we would ask them for certain non-personal data, technical data, which tends to prove that a thing existed at a certain time and place on the internet and wasn't created on Photoshop. Um, a lot of that, uh, a lot of those uh, avenues aren't currently open to us um, because the countries where, um, where. Uh, tech and other internet service providers are based uh, don't, have, uh, don't have any legal basis uh, to cooperate uh, with us in that regard. Um, the, the thing that has changed is uh, there are a range of protection issues and a range of contamination issues 
um, out there that don't, didn't exist before. So what's a contamination issue? Well, it's where everybody knows what happened because they saw it on a video. Um, that makes it very hard for us to uh, distinguish between um, people who may want to lie to us um, and people who are telling the truth. Um, in, you know, in, in investigations, you, you always need to hold back some information. Um, you always need to look for corroborating information. And insofar as social media um, has given us incredible opportunities um, to corroborate and make contact with people and have a view of what's happening in the world, um, it, uh, it also raises uh, very real issues in terms of, in terms of people Every, it's a level playing field. Everyone has that access to that information, and not all of those people are acting uh, in the interests of uh, justice. You have to understand one thing about the, the court which differentiates it from uh, human rights organisations and uh, state actors. We have a more remote operating environment, both in terms of space and in terms of time. So there are big time lags between when we when things happen and uh, when perhaps we get a mandate to investigate. That's, um, that's, uh, it's not always like that, but it's often the case. Um, what technology allows us to do is, um, is make the most of that remote operating environment. Um, so just one good example of it is before we ever launch an investigation, we do, uh, we do what's, what's called a preliminary a pr a preliminary. Uh, examination of a situation and that involves us looking at the crime base um, and then working our, our way uh, up from there hopefully um, and how do you examine a crime base in a country that you can't visit for instance um, well you you have quite powerful tools at your at your um, at your disposal now to examine that crime base and it's partly thanks to better communications in a traditional sense, but it's also due to the actions of, of media activists and people who are very active in the digital humanitarian world. Um, our aim is to close that impunity gap that arises from our remote operating environment in time and space by working in a, in a, in a close way uh, with, with all those actors.